Hello and welcome to this session. My name is Isabel Hilton. I'm the founder and senior advisor of the China Dialogue Trust, which is a charity headquartered in London uh, that's been reporting and publishing on major questions of environment and climate in China since 2006. And it's my great pleasure to be the moderator of this session in which we will be looking at the role and influence of Chinese media in Southeastern Europe. Beijing's rising footprint in the region's media sphere. Those of us who follow Chinese affairs are well aware of the huge investment in global public diplomacy that China has made since 2008, the year of the Beijing Olympics, and a year in which China watched as protesters hijacked its Olympic propaganda by piggybacking on the biggest uh, torch relay in history. And China realized in this watershed moment that it, it wanted to get control of the global narrative, at least where it concerns China, and to try to bring it into alignment with the propaganda effort at home. And since then, China's invested hugely in multi-pronged public diplomacy, greatly expanding the international reach of its own media, Xinhua, CGTN, China Daily, and so on and creating partnerships with national and local media in third countries. This can take the form of direct investment or contracts to publish Chinese produced material as supplements or copy that is paid for advertising, uh, but it is not evident uh, that it is such. There are other ways of recruiting support, for example, through programs of visits and so on. So this soft power effort is now seen as an essential component of Chinese diplomacy. It aims to project party propaganda and also importantly to squeeze out critical voices and to shut down independent views. Last year, in another front of these information wars, we also saw a record number of expulsions of foreign diplomats from China and official complaints from the European Union about China's social media disinformation campaigns. And we were reminded of the scale of China's interventions in overseas media last month when the Chinese media project, China Media Project, brought to our attention an article in the party newspaper, The People's Daily, which boasted that in the previous one week of the National People's Congress meeting in Beijing, a total of 750 unique articles in 12 languages had been successfully placed in nearly 200 media outlets from more than 40 countries. So that's the context for this discussion. What elements of this can we see in Southeastern Europe and what impact might it be having on public and political understanding and action? This region on the fringes of the EU has been assiduously courted by China through vehicles such as 17 plus one. How much discourse power has China achieved and is it able to challenge established European norms. Well, to explore these questions, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel, Dr. Giovanna Marovic, Executive Director of the Political Network, a think tank based in Podgorica. Giovanna studied in Belgrade, then worked as a councillor for the European Union in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and has held a number of related posts, including being part of the working group for Chapter 23 of the European Commission's Aki, as part of the Montenegrin Association accession negotiations for EU membership. And Vladimir Shopov, who is a visiting fellow with the Asia Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Vladimir was a full-time lecturer in politics at Sofia University and an adjunct professor at Sofia University and the new Bulgarian University. He's also been an external lecturer on the European Union, NATO security and Southeastern European affairs, at the Diplomatic Institute of the Bulgarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 2004. He's also the author of a recent report on this very subject. Uh, Vladimir, I'd like to begin with you, if I may, and invite you to lay out the problem as you discovered it in your recent research. Great, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for the possibility to present some of the findings of uh, our research, which we conducted ECFR together with the help of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And we basically tried to look at the media scape uh, in Southeast Europe, uh, predominantly from the perspective of uh, Chinese uh, uh, engagement, which in a wider context uh, has clearly been uh, expanding, uh, you know, looking beyond uh, uh, media and before I focus on uh, on media more specifically, 
it is there is a clear trajectory of uh, China's uh, presence uh, in the region now, maturing into a much more embedded uh, type of uh, uh, type of uh, type of engagement. Uh, you know, which is very clear from the types of interactions the Chinese actors have been having locally in the societies in the region. Uh, in other words, having more elaborate uh, interactions at various uh, levels, not just at the national uh, level, but also at the local level, at the municipal level, involving uh, more elements, uh, uh, more expansive uh, uh, type of engagement in more, in more areas of social and economic life. Uh, also a more granular approach, uh, you know, really trying to engage now with uh, institutions uh, uh, which are not uh, necessarily at the state level, which, as we know, traditionally has been the has been the focus of Chinese uh, of Chinese involvement. Um, I think, in overall terms, it's also quite evident that uh, the different uh, the different relationships are now much more institutionalized. In other words, we are past the initial kind of ad hoc. Uh, stage uh, when China was, you know, enter entering or re-entering uh, the region, depending on the country, and is now actively uh, building relationships in different in different areas of social, economic, and uh, and political life. Now, you know, beyond this kind of overall um, uh, overall finding, uh, let me now focus more specifically on the media sector. Uh, and firstly, in terms of content, I think there is sufficient evidence to say that, uh, uh, you know, there has been a sustained increase in China's presence across the entire media spectrum from uh, television to printed media, obviously, uh, you know, uh, online uh, media as well. Uh, and it has been overwhelmingly positive uh, in, uh, in tone, still mostly factual. Uh, lots of data, lots of um, lots of uh, uh, information about different uh, projects, increasingly about China uh, itself, its different policies, its different uh, uh, developments, and uh, all the rest of it. And also, I think interestingly, there has been very little criticism. I think that's uh, that's a very clear uh, feature of the current, um, uh, certainly of the current uh, stage of China's. Uh, presence in the region. Uh, although also, I think interestingly, the Chinese are increasingly using uh, a wide tool of um, toolbox, a wide set of instruments, uh, which basically range from the presence of Chinese outlets uh, in, in, you know, in most countries in the region, uh, but now, you know, in both engaging in buying of uh, media space. Uh, and that has been seen in a number of countries, such as you know Bulgaria, Serbia, to some extent in Montenegro. I mean, you know, for instance, in Bulgaria, uh, the Chinese um, uh, are you know are supporting financially a segment called Focus on uh, China, which essentially on a daily basis uh, uh, you know provides uh, a great deal of uh, mostly unedited information commentary. On Chinese affairs, on international uh, affairs, uh, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, obviously, there have been more traditional tools such as cooperation, uh, cooperation agreements, exchange visits. Uh, I don't think that there has been an intensification of those. Uh, but you know, in terms of uh, in terms of a uh, uh, you know, in terms of a, a tool of engagement uh, that really hasn't been. Uh, hasn't really been um, uh, particularly particularly new. I think the other interesting another interesting finding that I would like to share is that uh, on the basis of our research, it's possible to say that we are seeing the you know an emerging constituency of interested partners. Uh, you know, a cooperative space between local and Chinese uh, uh, actors, uh, which basically has uh, three pillars. Uh, the first one being legacy contacts and uh, partners and, uh, and networks, uh, you know, which in some cases date back uh, uh, decades. You know, for instance, this, you know, these are the various uh, uh, 
association of, uh, of journalists in many countries in the region, uh, uh, you know, with you know, with whom the Chinese are increasingly uh, interacting in Bulgaria, in Serbia, but also in other countries as well. I think, secondly, there is a second pillar, uh, which you know, basically, you know, where we can see again, kind of emerging institutional alliances. Uh, uh, you know, these are uh, these are more regularized and institutionalized contacts with state news agencies, with ministries, uh, with the media departments of state institutions, um, uh, with some even with some media regulators in the in a couple of uh, uh, in a couple of countries, uh, and also again, quite quite importantly, uh, you know, we can see. Uh, a number of uh, a number of instances where there have been kind of implicit pacts uh, uh, for non uh, information uh, you know there have been some uh, instances in montenegro in macedonia in serbia uh, you know where the chinese uh, you know acting in concert with uh, state institutions have been quite unwilling uh, to provide a lot of information about about different projects or about different activities so this is really so the kind of second at propaganda like, and at, at censorship on in in the same package in in these cases. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but time is flying mm -hmm. by, um, and and that was hugely interesting. Um, I mm -hmm. wonder if if we could perhaps move on um, uh, to Duvana to to get an, a sense of some specific cases of Chinese of Chinese uh, action or Chinese influence in media, Duvana. Thank you very much and thank you uh, for invitation. It's really my pleasure to, to, to share my thoughts about the Chinese influence in the Western Balkans and, and more precisely in Montenegro and Serbia. Yes, that's true that the narrative about and reporting about Chinese influence in the local media in the Western Balkans is more positive than, than negative. The main reasons for, for such developments are that the pro-government media are still dominant uh, comparing to independent media. The second thing is that they are always, and, and as a rule, reporting in the way that the ruling parties want to. And then the, that they have usually bombastic titles in order to gain much uh, attention from, from the public. And then the, the, it was the same situation in Montenegro with the same, same government, which we had for 30 years. They were the ones who, who concluded that a highway contract with the Chinese company, which has many negative sides, but those negative um, sides of the contract were not the public, were not um, communicated with the public because there was understanding between Chinese company and, and China in general with the ruling elite. But there is a, a kind of, of a turn in the narrative of, of, the, of the officials in Montenegro because Montenegro changed the government after the last year's parliamentary elections and the new government brought the, the, the issue with, with China, with China uh, to the public and to the European Commission, to, to, to European Union in general. And there is a huge public debt in Montenegro because of that contract. It, it, it is now over 100% of the GDP. And during the last month's visit to, to Brussels, uh, the vice, vice prime minister of Montenegro uh, asked the European Commission, European Union to help to repay Chinese uh, uh, loan to, to China. And that's why uh, there were lots of reactions from the European Union, uh, lots of media at attention in Montenegro, but also lots of reactions from, from Chinese embassy in Montenegro. And that's how this narrative in Montenegro actually changed. It's more negative uh, at the moment than positive, meaning that the, uh, the, the issues which are in the, in the center of the project are now uh, have more media attention than the, the, the uh, narrative from the previous government that the highway project is the project of the century. And then uh, Europe, the, the, at least now the European Union had their own position regarding Chinese influence in Montenegro, but also in the Western Balkans, explaining that the European Union 
is not repaying the, the loans of the third parties, but they, they are willing to help Montenegro and the rest of the Western Balkans with the new project, infrastructure project, and the other help and support in order to, ha to, uh, to have uh, like a, a con to control Chinese influence in the Western Balkans. So it's all about official reactions because they are usually cautious, meaning that they are in desperate need for the money. There are huge financial issues in the Western Balkans. And that's why they are uh, trying to have this kind of many ups and downs uh, toward, even when it comes to strategy towards China and Chinese companies and they, their interest in, in the Balkans. Okay. And the case, Fantastic. just to, to, to mention sure. the second case yep. of the vaccine diplomacy in Serbia, where it is for the first time that uh, yeah. the official position of, of uh, Belgrade is confronting the EU position, meaning that there are many bombastic titles in the local media, that the EU is in a big, big problem and the countries are moving towards Russia and China. So that's for the first time that we have change of the narrative in Serbia, meaning uh, more positive towards China and negative towards the EU. That's very interesting, and I, I guess Serbia is, is you know, a p particularly uh, visible case of that. But I wanted to ask both of you, we, we've got just a few minutes left, um, how effective you, you, you believe this to be in terms of public opinion? I mean, in, in, in polling in, in Western Europe, China has never been less popular, so the, its media push has not been particularly fruitful. Is this different in SE? Is it having an impact in South, Southeast Europe? Is it having an impact on public opinion, as far as you can tell? Vladimir, perhaps well, we, you could... Oh, if, 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 no, we try to measure what the public opinion uh, in Montenegro about the highway project because that's the, the that's the way the China is present in Montenegro, and the public opinion uh, uh, it was like around seventy percent of people that they believe that it it is positive to have the highway project, but they are skeptical about the uh, you know the way the, the the country will be able to repay loan. So it's not that uh, the, they have uh, an opinion about Chinese influence, but now they are very, very active uh, on the social media through different media channels, trying to, to, you know, trying to push this narrative that the EU should step in and should help Montenegro in order to have like uh, the, the, this uh, better approach from the EU level and to, to move China, China from, from the country. So I guess that the, the, the current mood is more negative than positive in the public opinion. Vladimir. I think, I think analytically it would probably be a bit difficult to isolate specifically the, you know, the, the impact of, uh, of uh, you know, to what extent its current presence is really influencing uh, public opinion. Uh, but I think it's the, the the importance of what the Chinese are doing uh, lies in a couple of other in a couple of other directions. One is that a lot of the uh, a lot of the content that is being supplied, uh, you know, is you know in Western terminology pure propaganda. I mean, it's completely unedited. It's completely uh, uh, uncritical. There are serious uh, issues of transparency and. Uh, uh, access to real information, uh, because clearly governments in many countries are working together with the Chinese to suppress the publication of information. And, and we have a significant number of institutional issues as well, uh, because in Southeast Europe, we now have the emergence of very peculiar types of organizations. And let me just give you one example, the Southeast European Business Association, which is based in which is based in in Zagreb, you know, which is a China substructure that ha that, that actually has a multiple multiple functions. I mean, it's it's PR, it's lobbying, it's content generation, and it's a cooperation facilitation platform. Uh, you know, all at the same time, and it's uh, you know feeding in privately. Uh, information to different uh, different organizations, uh, and just the last the last the last point on this is that we have been getting more and more reports about Chinese embassies locally in the region being more willing uh, to informally contact and uh, you know media outlets which are which are critical of China 
which are publishing which are publishing um, uh, stories which uh, which and commentaries which are critical uh, and uh, on you know from from what we are hearing these are not very pleasant exchanges, in addition to the fact that a lot of these journalists actually are continuously harassed in many countries uh, from the institutions of the state themselves. So clearly this is a, a pretty comprehensive united front effort um, from, from your description, Vladimir, and perhaps one that we ought to be more concerned with. Um, I could very happily continue this conversation for a long time, but sadly we have just run out of time. So it remains for me to thank um, Delphi for the invitation and, and a warm thank to excellent panelists who've given us a real insight into the perhaps less obvious sides of Chinese uh, influence. Vladimir Giovanna, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you.